All right, welcome everybody. Our speaker tonight as part of Earth Week Art Events is artist Amy Gross. Tonight's talk is part of a series made possible by an FEP grant from the Broward College Student Life Department. We'll have a new lineup of speakers beginning in September. Amy Gross earned her BFA at the Cooper Union School in New York City and has worked as a surface designer, creating textiles, toys, and jewelry before turning full-time to fiber art. She has exhibited across the country, including the Boca Raton Museum of Art, the Minnesota Museum of American Art, the American International Fine Art Fair, and winning Best in Show at several art exhibits, as well as the prestigious South Florida Cultural Consortium Prize. Amy uses everyday materials such as yarn, thread, beads, and wire to create objects that mimic the natural world with incredible precision and realism. Her fiber and mixed media sculptures named Biotopes reflect on the inevitability of change, decay, and extinction. And if you have a minute after the talk, you should look at some of her pieces in person to really see some of the details. Uh, when describing her artistic inspiration, Amy states, I've always been attracted and frightened by things that are in their fullest bloom, but on the verge of spoiling. There's such beauty and sadness to them, heightened by the undeniable inevitability of their ending. At a time when we're becoming more and more aware of the damaging interactions between man and nature, my objects are considering mutations of the real and the engineered. My making these things will not stop time, but hold things still selfishly for a little while. In a time when we are becoming aware of the limits of our presence here, the need to pause feels paramount. Uh, also, join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. for a free afternoon workshop with Amy. Uh, she'll be leading a hands-on experience in creating your own embroidered nature collage and will assist you in quickly learning sewing, embroidery, and beadwork skills. And of course, that's open to both men and women. You guys shouldn't be afraid to sew. Um, so please join me in welcoming Amy Gross. And there'll be time for questions afterward. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, before I begin, uh, I want to thank Lisa and Broward College for asking me to be a part of their artist series and to talk about the work and the reason that I make things. Uh, Lisa is uh, a fiber art hero around here, and I was very proud to be part of her um, fantastic show, Fiber Optics. There we go. Fiber Optics at uh, 1310 Gallery. Um, fiber is just a very uh, small amount of the wide range of materials that she uses in her own work, uh, but uh, she did a series called Vein Mapping and some of uh, my favorite things that she does. And I think that Probably it is her experience with all different kinds of material that makes her so open to what fiber can do. And she makes no assumptions about what fiber art should look like or allude to, because it can be and it can do anything. Um, the show that Lisa created include yarn wrapped staircases and a giant spider web and an elevator and an elevator operator who was cocooned in knit. Uh, it was its own universe, but at the same time it was deeply involved in this conversation with the outer world. And I don't like to make blanket statements about what an artist does, but I will in this case, uh, because I think artists, we talk to ourselves, and then we hope at the same time that we're managing to translate uh, as much as we can into a larger conversation. Now, a lot of artists tell you that they dread talking about their work, because what we do mainly is this kind of wordless process that's like this swirl of stream of consciousness, pictures on a wall, uh, this object that we found on a walk, scraps of old experiences, you know, things we saw on the internet, and stuff we read in a book. And it's always kind of mysterious because we can't specifically say this is how we did it. Uh, we can't say we did it step by step because sometimes it works when you do it step by step, and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, unless a piece is specifically didactic, it's about a certain thing, it's hard to talk about it clearly and concisely to make like, this really simple story about it. And I think that's why artists always say that the work should speak for itself. And it's not because we don't like talking about ourselves, because we really do. But 
because we fear that if we have to sum it up in one sentence, uh, we're going to sound like a stammering fool. But I think that when you get the opportunity to take your work into a larger context, you do it. Because you spend lots, I spent a lot of time listening to artists speak, uh, especially at a time where I did not consider myself an artist. And uh, I needed to hear that there wasn't just one way to become one, uh, or that you had to be a certain kind of person to be an artist. So I needed to demystify the process and hear what kind of people's experiences, the small ones and the large ones, combined to make the kind of artwork that ended up in front of me. So uh, I think the mystery to me was how I wound up making work that was so different from the kind of uh, artwork that I was making when I was in my 20s. And that's because of all these detours and delays and mental roadblocks that I set up for myself. But that's the great surprise of it all. Now, um, I've been doing what I've do, been doing for about nine years and full time for only about two. Uh, so there's been a lot more non-fiber sculpture time in my life, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, first of all, I was very fortunate and I knew it. I was born into a family of artists. So the house that I grew up in New York was filled with my father's paintings and my parents' books and my mother's music. And I was really just a train ride away from New York City and the museums and the galleries. And weekends and vacations were spent sitting next to my dad as he painted landscapes. And I tried, tried really hard to paint landscapes. Uh, so I wanted to be an artist, and that was never questioned. And I had some friends whose families actually gave them a very hard time because they, made, uh, they had decided to be something very impractical. And you see, there's me and my dad from, I think, about age six till I was in my 20s. And this is, uh, I was looking at this photograph and I realized that this was the last painting that my father ever painted. And uh, that was the last trip that we took together to paint. I drew uh, in, the in my sketchbook on the right and that was my dad's painting on the left. And we were in the sculpture gardens of the Society of the Four Arts about four years ago. And then he died very soon after. I was also really lucky to live in a town that had a salt marsh preserve. And uh, it was sandwiched between these split levels and these ranch houses. Uh, and it was right next to a shopping center and a, uh, a landfill. And I got to work, it was called the Marine Nature Study Area, and I got to work there in summers, and I didn't have to be an arts and crafts counselor at the summer camps. So uh, I got to spend summers watching horseshoe crabs mating and digging holes in marsh mud, and they had us out on the marshes counting dead flies and fly traps. They literally walked, you'd go up to a dead, uh, to a fly trap, and then they would, we'd look into it and they'd say, guess how many dead flies are in there? And we would guess, and then we'd write it down on a piece of paper. I guess they did something with it in the end. Um, so it sort of began this fascination with all these tiny ecosystems under my feet. And the biologists there who worked there full time didn't, after I finished doing all the things that I had to do for the job, they let me go off and paint. So you can see some of the watercolors that I did those summers that I worked there. Uh, the top is a photograph of what it looked like. That was before Sandy. Turns out that Hurricane Sandy really ripped it apart. So these were these great summers filled with a combination of dirt and fiddler crabs and birds' nests and floating garbage and microbe-filled water, and uh, so I realized that nature was a real thing. It wasn't just idealized and pristine, but it was in a cold war with the, su with the suburbs. Now again, I was also very lucky to be accepted to the only art school I wanted to go to. Uh, that was Cooper Union. Because if you go to Cooper Union, you get to go to some of the most wonderful galleries on, plan, on the planet uh, during your lunch breaks, and you can go up to 57th Street and down to Soho, and you get to meet uh, interesting painters and performance artists. And so I started wearing a lot of black, and I had an asymmetrical haircut, like long on one side and short on the other. And I wore a lot of black and had a lot of earrings in one ear, and I tried really, really hard to look like the kids that went there. They went to school in the city, and they seemed about 50 years older uh, in experience and seemed to know more about everything than I did. And no matter what I did, I still looked suburban, but I really I fought a good fight. 
So this was my senior show at Cooper Union. I had to find these pictures. They were in a shoebox in a closet. And I was joking. I remember joking with my friend I shared the show with, saying that this is probably the last art show I will ever have. And it turned out I wasn't right about that, but I didn't have another art show for 18 years. I think even though it's pretty abstract, and it was the 80s, so everybody was, was uh, abstract, uh, I was still doing landscapes. It was my square cloud. I didn't even name these at the time. And these were the last things I painted when I was in my early 20s. Okay, and then here was, right after graduation, I spent the summer at the Skowhegan School of Painting in Maine, where it was an incredibly beautiful place, and I produced absolutely nothing of value at all. So I, I tried um, my paintings. I don't even have the paintings anymore. But uh, what I do remember and what I still kept was uh, the, the pen and ink and these charcoal drawings. I would just go into the fields, and I would sit there and just scrawl. And what I think it did for me is that for, I got to experience nature without the kind of, you know, the uh, intersection of suburbia. And it wasn't exactly the wilderness, but it was about as close as I had gotten until that point. And Maine is interesting because it's also a very extreme place where there are ant hills that are about three feet high. And I had, uh, you know, so dark that if you wanted to walk from your studio back down to your cabin, you had to look up and look at the break to see where the stars were. So there would be black on one side, and then there would be a little strip of stars, and you knew that was the road. And I'd never known dark like that before. So I came back, and I wasn't becoming the kind of artist that I assumed I was going to be. And I worked hard at painting, and I stumbled through some ideas, but I was 20 years old, and I was rejected by the few galleries that I showed my work to, and I felt like it was a tragedy. And I hated everybody who ignored me or wouldn't pay attention to me, and then I decided that something was missing. It had to be me. It had to be that I had some of the pieces that make up a painter, but not the most important ones. So I had a missing part. Maybe I wasn't bohemian enough, or I wasn't outrageous enough, or maybe I just didn't have enough fascinating ideas. And it turned out that I was pretty good at a design business that I had started. That's what my dad had done for a living, so I had apprenticed myself to him. And uh, I, came, I came up with a portfolio for doing surface and textile designs for children. Now, I think that most people wind up doing something very different from what they plan to do when they're teenagers. And so I think I sort of became, I became what the job was. I became the job I took on. And there were realities that everybody meets at some point, which was food and rent and utilities. And I didn't want to sponge off of my family. And I really wanted to be successful and accepted and take care of myself. And I think that's the way it works for us most of the time. Uh, it's a little easier now, I guess, because of crowdsourcing and Kickstarter. But at the time, there was absolutely no, except for begging for grants, there was really no other way of doing it. So I designed children's bedding and rugs and curtains and beach towels and furniture and toys. And I think the one reason I would never go back and start over a different way um, is because it forced me to stop thinking of myself as an artist. Because I think what my idea of an artist was was more of an identity and less something that I did. And I stopped thinking of myself as an artist completely. If you asked me what I was, I would tell you that I was a designer. Now, I'm not saying the designers are not artists, because they absolutely are. But I said to myself, I absolutely am not one. And so I let go of all my illusions and presuppositions and typecasting. And I stopped letting talent or whatever I was born with define me. Because I think what I was doing is that I was forcing myself to think of artists as what I was instead of neglecting the why. And I was neglecting the why. And I think that's the problem of deciding what you are when you're 20. So for any students here who think that they need to know exactly what they want to do when they're in their 20s or late teens, it's, it's not true. And then I also realized that no one was watching me, which was also a wonderful thing, because it didn't matter whether I did anything, whether I created any art, my mom and dad might care, 
but if I never picked up a pencil or a brush or arranged or assembled anything, no one would have cared. And it sounds kind of sad, but it wasn't because I think waiting and pretending that the world is waiting for you to show up is a really big waste of time. And so realizing that nobody cared was the best thing that could ever happen to me. Uh, this was a design, uh, I was doing ch Children of the World for FAO Schwartz. So then what happened next is something that I didn't plan, I moved to Florida. And there were a lot of practical reasons why I moved to Florida, but uh, they're not that interesting. And since I was no longer like the New york kind of stereotype artist that I had made up, it didn't mean that I had to stay in New York anymore. And because of the internet, uh, I could live anywhere I wanted. And I actually worked for a lot of people at my job that I'd never met. So here I was in Boca Raton. And I set up my design studio. And I sat down and decided I was going to live my life the way that I lived in New York. But uh, it seemed kind of like the suburban town that I grew up in. And it was near the ocean. It had you know, malls and shopping centers and lawns and you know, five Starbucks everywhere you turned. But there was no winter and no slush. But there was also something else. There was strange things, of course, like alligators. And, and it wasn't just that there were alligators, but there were um, sort of this, this kind of strange, barely articulated hum behind all of the normalcy of the condos and the subdivisions. And something seemed very sped up and accelerated and strange. And this was nothing I experienced in New York. So I started noticing the drainage canals between all of these tidy subdivisions, and these kind of like everything goes bio communities sandwiched in between them. And I remember taking a walk on military trail on a really warm day. And this smell came out from one of the canals. And it was, the, uh, it was an amazing thing. It was concentrated, and it was all humid plant and dead animal and sitting water. My mom and I used to hike up in Connecticut when we lived in up north. But you always felt that you would survive these hikes. And uh, you feel like if you went into one of these drainage canals, you were going to disappear, and they would never find you ever again. So this is, there's this town, Boca Raton, where you're, you, know, you can go anywhere and spend the entire day. And you're, you're about as, you come back, and you're as clean as you can be. But all around you, there's like this suppressed native force of will. And it was, I found it really fascinating. So I started spending um, more and more time in the preserves here, where uh, there are less and less of them every year. But uh, this here is Loxahatchee Preserve off of Route 441 up in, um, in um, right north of Delray. And Lakota Hatchee in Delray also. Uh, this here is, this is, uh, I forgot what it's called, oh, duckweed, I'm sorry, where it starts to grow in the spring. Until they, this actually looks like a lawn, but this is a pond. We had nothing like this in New York. You see, if it looks like you could stand on it, it would hold your weight. But if you walked on it, you'd step right through and drown. And uh, there were strangler figs in these preserves and paths strewn with all these insects that, you know, they seem to come straight out of the Bible. And it's not that anything is really that extreme or, or it's not like the jungles of Southeast Asia. And you don't even have to notice it if you don't. Um, you know, even the banyan trees, which are wonderful, they, they cut them and keep them under control. And so even though everything is under the mercy of, uh, really of the uh, financiers and the developers, you know, I felt that if you looked really close at all the set aside and avoided parts of Florida, you can see that there were these, these worlds that were so complicated and interwoven and sewn together so tightly and so amazing on an intimate scale. And this is breadfruit. I love also how you can bring things from uh, so many different South American countries and African countries, and it survives here. That's a kapok tree. And here's some of the banyans. I think what's wonderful is when you don't grow up here, you come to these you come to the state and you see things like this and they straight out of a fairy tale. And there's mangroves. And that's a wonderful tree down in Fairchild Tropical Gardens. I can't imagine how this happened. That has to be cement. 
And these are lichens, and these are lichens growing on a palm tree in front of the TJ Maxx off of Glades Road in Boca. And there's again these wonderful lichens. So it didn't mean all of a sudden I was going to start to paint, but I started to collage and sketch to keep a visual diary, and I'd always done that, but I used to stop and start all the way. So here I am, I was trying it again in 2002. So you can see I was starting to think about bees, then about birds, and close-ups and landscapes far away. So what I started to do after that is I had this really, suddenly I had this need to make something. So I started making jewelry. Now necklaces didn't have to be a serious statement. I wasn't talking about society. I wasn't doing anything serious. I could just sit down and I could start using all the things that I started to notice and make objects out of them. Now I'd always used a computer for my business. And I used to bring home things that I collected on my walks and things that were interesting, but uh, insect wings and stones and leaves and fragments of shells, so I would photograph them. And I would alter them in Photoshop. And then I would print them on fabric. And I had collected beads since I was a kid. And I used to, so what I would do is I would start to string and wrap them and twist them around pendants. So I was mimicking what I was seeing in the world without having to make a statement about it. And I think what it also did is it got me reacquainted with making something that was physical because in the 23 years that I had been working on surface design, I, in the beginning I painted and everything had to be painted. But then when the computer took over, everything was done on the computer. So I realized that everything was lines of code. I once was doing a project, literally vanished overnight. There was like this little and it was gone. And I worked on this project, I think it was a blanket design that I'd worked on for two weeks. And it vanished, it was completely gone. And I took it to my guru, the guy who taught me the computer, and he said that probably there was a triangle where there should have been an X in the line of code. And so it was gone forever. And so that terrified me because all I realized that I was working on things that didn't exist. And I wanted to make things with my hand again. And what was great is that I could use the computer as part of the process because I could alter things and I could take them from life and then I could translate physical things and then put them into the computer and then translate them back into physical things. But I stopped making necklaces because I felt limited by their need to be pretty and wearable. And um, I think jewelry is, can be very interesting and very challenging, but um, at the time, uh, they were, I was really just making decorative things, and I didn't want to be decorative anymore. And I also wanted to get away from attractive things because life was getting a little less attractive. So I finally let myself consider the idea of translating the te techniques that I worked uh, into canvas. Now, the last time I'd sat down to do something formal, it was ink and watercolor and collaging, but I didn't want to do this anymore. Uh, I had sewn my jewelry and used beads, and I had started to teach myself to embroider. I think I learned French knots from Martha Stewart, watching the Martha Stewart show. And uh, I found this little book in the arts and crafts section of Barnes and Noble and started using beads and thread instead of paint. Now, my grandmother on both sides, both, they sewed and knit, but my mother doesn't. So it's not something she taught me, and she's sitting right there, yeah. And she'd say it's a very good thing. She was the person who would darn socks, and she would bunch it all together. And so it, like, the darning would be so thick that it would be like the size of, what, like a pebble? And then you'd walk the whole day and come back, and your feet were bleeding. So she's, I think that sometimes these feminine skills skip generations. Uh, and I think one reason I was so interested in needlework is because I wasn't forced to learn it, and it wasn't used to measure my worth as it had for so many women and so many generations of women. And I hated home economics. And uh, when I was learning it in like the 1970s, I wasn't alone in this because every girl I knew had to sit there and make that plaid skirt. And we really, really, really hated it. Uh, I have this, you can see here, um, where girls, young, young girls, sometimes it's amazing, like the girl up in the upper right corner was 10 years old where she learned this sampler. And they would do these sample books where they do these tiny, tiny little versions of dresses but it wasn't, they were not toys. They were learned so that they would have either a skill to get by until they married or to 
sort of have the skills that they would need as wives and to convince their, everybody of their value as future wives and mothers. Now, Sheila Payne has this, this wonderful, wonderful book um, called Embroidered Textiles, and she quotes a 1920s article, I love this, uh, where she says that needlework reflected a generally accepted view which still persists of embroidery as a pastime for idle ladies, a pastime which, though much modern work can be considered a creative art, it is more usually relegated by popular opinion to the homely level of a sentimental sampler on a wall, a needlepoint cushion on the fireside armchair, or a linen tea cozy worked by crinoline ladies. And this was in 1920s, so even 60 years before I decided that it wasn't cool, it, the people were deciding that it was not cool. And because this view was completely justified, I mean, it was justified because of the, the result of Western society's women's liberation and the fact that women had choices and freedom and they, didn't have, and they had freedom from worth through homemaking. So needlework in the US had become really, really estranged from its original roots and meanings. Now, the first function of embroidery, embroidery was to embellish and to decorate. And according to Sheila Payne, it's not just to decorate as we would understand it. Because in ancient societies, the mysteries of nature and of disease and disaster were all explained not through science, but through mythology and gods and good and bad spirits, nature worship and the evil eye. So the first way to protect societies from the spirits were through tattooing. So people would tattoo their skin because the symbols were visual protection. And then what happened after that is that embroidery became the tattooing of fabric. So every color and every motif and symbol had a formalized meaning. And so it marked childbirth and it marked death. It decided who, it decided who you were and who you belonged to. And it celebrated uh, and appeased the spirits so that the spirits could either, um, they could protect you or they could punish you. But as the centuries passed, the symbols became more and more generalized and simplified, so they all lost their original meaning. And I think that's probably one reason why they lost so much of their value for women, because they were traditions, but they no longer had the power and the fear that they once had um, connected and held. So they represented convention all of a sudden and archaic rules and captivity to old values. So the rejection was inevitable and the transformation of needlework into fiber art began. And you can see just in the 1940s and 50s what it meant. And this is how they sold needles to ladies. But fiber art was used as a mean, uh, means of expression for decades before me. This is uh, Magdalena Abakanovitz, who made these monumental fi uh, fiber sculptures in the 1960s and 70s. And Miriam Shapiro, who used traditional female motifs as a way to elevate to the level of art what was particular to women's work. Uh, she actually uh, was rejected by a lot of male um, art dealers because she had been doing very hard-edged, very masculine work for this and then decided that she wasn't interested in it anymore. And she lost galleries because she started doing things that the uh, male gallery owners decided were way too feminine and not part of their audience. And this is Louise Bourgeois who is my absolute hero. And she's a daughter of a tapestry restorer who made um, art out of every material you can think of. She'll make things out of stone and metal and glass and bronze. And she can make tiny things. And then she also did a piece that was about the size of a locomotive of a train that went back and forth. And it, it just killed me when I saw it when I was in school. But to me, it was always her sewn objects that I love the most because she would create these little elegant and rough creatures with tortured fabric for skin. And her uh, old clothes, clothes from her past, uh, mattresses, and she used them as geometrics that held the DNA and the history of the women that wore it and her own DNA and her own life stories. And this is Kiki Smith, who technically does not often work with fabric, but her paper sculptures uh, when I first saw uh, them in art school, had the look of tissue and fabric to me. And it looks like her figures have sort of walked out and left their souls in their bodies and shed them like insects. And they look like abandoned clothing and like souls at the same time. But I came to needlework, I think, because like the artists before me, I was allowed to define it for myself. 
And for me, sewing transforms one surface into another physically, and it seems to also transform it emotionally. And sewing fixes one thing to another and holds it tight, and it's still the best way and the strongest way to hold an incision in surgery. And what I love about how embroidery is how formal and decorative it can be, but it imitates real things so perfectly. It can look like moss and grass and lichens and soil and roots and beads mimic seeds and it mimics fruit and bubbles and water droplets and ice. So here's actual beads and then a berry from one of the nature preserves around here. And this is actually Though it looks like a beaded object, this is dried blood on a piece of gauze in a, in a microscope. Now, I grew up in a very interesting time. So I was born in 1965, so you can do the math. Uh, and there was no time in my memory where we hadn't been able to look at the planet from a distance, or our entire world was transformed into an eyeball-sized eyeball sphere. But in the 1970s, there had been this little revolution in education. So all my textbooks were rewritten and filled cover to cover with pictures. So they were illustrations of the cross sections of the earth and human skin in the same way, and hair follicles and trees in the same scale and details. So all of a sudden, we had all of these photographs from electron microscopes that made the tiniest things look minuscule. And this is pollen. And this is the cilia in your, in your lungs which actually looks like a plant to me. And this is algae and the, bl the brain's blood vessels. And there was this wonderful book that came out about that time called The Powers of Ten, where you could, uh, it started with uh, a, pic a picnic and couple sleeping on a uh, blanket. And then it's, it snaked down into their skin and uh, it took down into the molecular weight, like as far as you could go into the skin and then zoomed back up out and into space and backwards through the solar system and into the way back into the uh, universe so that the things that were the tiniest actually wound up looking like that's, the, I think, the smallest things that can be photographed. And that's the Earth from the edge of the solar system. And they started to look the same to me. Now, this is a common thing now because of the internet, but at the time it was a pretty big deal. So we found out that daisy pollen looks so much like a plant that's actually in real life. It's a puffball mushroom. And there's fungus and berries. And that's a flower pot mushroom. So when I was a kid, the Museum of Natural History was the most amazing place I'd ever been. And uh, we even had a little uh, museum in uh, Long Island. So you go for a walk outside, and then you can go inside. And they would show you the place that you just walked in, in uh, side view. So you'd get to look under the water, on top of the water at the same time. So it was fake, meant real, and it was meant to represent the real world. So I decided that when I started to make things again, that I was going to do my own little museum of natural history. So this is called Underground Nest. And I was deciding I was going to recreate nature in my own image. And this was based on a real experience that I had in Maine when I was up in Skowhegan. I was pounding through this forest path on the Skowhegan campus, and I freaked out a nest of bees. And they came out of this trunk of the tree, and they chased me, and I start screaming, and I'm running down this hill going, bleh, and feeling like nature was betraying me, and why didn't you love me, because I love you. And it hurt like hell. But afterwards, I got very interested in the idea of the hidden and the unarticulated. It's a hidden world, of, and it's there all our time, but it's hidden from our attention. So how much of the world are we ignorant of, and how much can we ignore and still think we know who we are and what we're doing? So how much of the real picture are we getting? And so here, you can see, I don't have a close-up of this one because this was early on, but you can see that there are bees hidden in an incision. It's as if you had cut up a piece of the ground and the bees are underneath and there's just a suggestion of berries and bees and unartic unarticulated life. And I think as people, we remake what we see into our own stories because we have to, because we need to understand it, and we need to understand 
what it's about. You know, nature just is. So this is called Look Down and Look Under. And this is what, further thinking about placid, unremarkable surfaces and hidden hives and the ground splitting open and things happening just outside our reach. And this was more like I had uh, sort of lifted up the skin of the ground, taking this to the, you know, sort of like the next step from the other one of lifting the surface and exposing what was underneath. Sort of like when you lift up a stone in your backyard or in the woods. And I had to do this, I think, because it was a time when people very close and important to me were being diagnosed with very serious medical problems. And what happens, I think, is when you get the shock of those kinds of diagnoses is that especially, you know, when there's no outward symptoms, you have very little warning or suggestion that life is about to change. So suddenly you have to live with this terrible, terrible news, and you have to adjust, and you have to figure out what you're going to do with it. This happens to almost everybody, because I think no, uh, nobody ever gets through life without any of this happening to them. And you look around, and you've gotten this test results, and you realize that nothing on the surface of life has changed. Everything looks exactly the same, but everything is different. Everything is completely altered by the news that something you can't, about something that you can't see. But you still see it in your head all the time. And it changes the way you go through your everyday life and the way you view the past. So you're suddenly aware of the hidden secret life of things. And when you're looking at something, you're not just looking at it. You're feeding into it what you know and what you remember and what you've seen and read. So when I made a particular time of day, I was trying to describe this as if you were looking down at a patch of ground. And it's at the same time, it's also like a sort of petri dish of your experiences. So here there's photographed paper and fabric transfers and recreations of leaves that I had collected on my walks in my old life. And there are flowers that I'd seen in an old 19th century botany book that look beautiful and strange. And there's larvae and lichens and mushrooms. And there, everything is captured at like, one moment in their stage of growth. But in the corner, there's a half-buried ailing human heart. It's an anatomically correct human heart. And then there are bees. You can sort of see the bees there uh, circling. And I use them because in the beginning, bees were sort of mimicking the way your thoughts circulate when you can't stop thinking about something. And you keep going around and around in it. And I was thinking recently about uh, how before science and technology began to explain the world to us, we used to think of illnesses being caused by mists. And by float they thought they were the floating clouds traveling, the space between us. Um, and we developed the ability to see what this actually was, to see that it's viruses and bacteria. And we know what they do and how they do it. But science doesn't always describe how it feels to experience the effects of these actual organisms even though it does alter you know, what you see and how you think. But I think that art's job is to sort of describe what these kinds of things feel like. And I think what it does is that it turns things back into symbols. And in a way, it turns it back into mists again. But I think we need to accompany science with these kinds of mists to get us through it all. And this is called preoccupation. I think uh, what was happening here is that I was paying so much attention to things that I was fearing and how to illustrate things that I was fearing and making art out of them that I got pulled into my head, I think, a little bit too much. You get drawn into the inside of your eye, and your interior life starts to dominate. So you're, you're thinking about things more than you're actually experiencing them. And it's like looking through the wrong end of a telescope. So when I made preoccupation, I was trying to describe what I was feeling and also to describe what it felt like to feel this way. So I was using a uh, human heart in there, and roots, and veins, and flowers, and blood, and stones. But there's a landscape in the distance. There's kind of a way out. Uh, it's in the background, and it's unfocused, and it's hard to see what's on the other side. But I think that when you're trapped in your head, and you're sick, and you're held hostage by your changing body, there's always that tease of escape and that tease of distance. It's there, but it's not really there for you. And I think that's why I love 16th and 17th century Flemish paintings so much, uh, the German and Flemish paintings, because even though all the action's happening in the foreground, you look uh, through the windows in the back, and there's a whole world out there. 
And you know that important things are happening in that room, but somehow there's, the world is still going on outside. And that's an also another reason why I love, uh, love Pierre Bonnard so much, because he always had windows open and ways out. So because of all these things happening, uh, my interest in the Florida landscape was starting to make sense to me. So uh, there was that idea of the takeover and retreat inside people's bodies, and then there was this takeover and retreat going on in the outside world. This is a, uh, the beginning of, of a plan. You can see how it just hooked up and started to attach itself to the host tree. And I'm really fascinated by symbiosis, which is a term of science because I steal from science all the time. And it means the interaction of two or more biological uh, uh, systems living together in kind of like an intimate association. You can see here, this is a strangler fig. What a strangler fig does is that it works its way up a tree. It looks like it's hugging it, but it's strangling it more often. And sometimes it's positive, and sometimes it's uh, to mutual benefit. But here, uh, the strangler fig climbs up, and it uses the tree to support itself as it climbs towards the sunlight. But then it actually kills the tree. And there's uh, galls here, which also is uh, insects that grow inside the stalks of plants and trees. So molds are symbiotes, and fungus and symbi are symbiotes, and insects and bacteria and viruses. And in a way, illness works the same way. This is a blushing bromeliad, which it's a fantastic plant that grows around here. And I thought in the beginning that I was hoping that the purple plant was another plant that chose to live in the middle, but actually that's its flower. But you can see that it lives off the nutrients from whatever gets caught. So it forms like this little soup of stuff that the plant lives off of and everything winds up in. And here uh, is a bee's hive. It's a beehive. Uh, this one's in France. And they could not understand, the beekeepers could not understand why the, uh, why the bees were, turning, were making these blue beehives. But it turned out that the bees were buzzing and pollinating in plants near a M&M factory. And they were uh, taking back the pollen that it was actually stained with this dust from the M&Ms and bringing it back and making these little blue beehives. So this is some of what I uh, chose to hear. Uh, this was my decision on change, but I, I decided not to make a judgment as to whether the change that I was experiencing was good or bad. And it's about things that I choose to ignore and things that I choose to listen to. Again, this is came close to drowning, and this is a piece that's actually based on an actual experience I had. Uh, it's also the biggest thing that I ever made. It's about 60 by 60. And it's on a round canvas, so it's like this gigantic embroidery hoop. And people have been telling me since I was in art school that you have to work large. So work large. And so I finally did, but I don't think I'll ever do it again because it took six months, and it was painful. So I had bruises up and down my arms from reaching underneath, and I don't want my uh, artwork to be damaging to my arms. But uh, this was based on an experience I had whitewater rafting in Connecticut where... Um, they were convinced somehow because I had a low center of gravity. This was the first time that they, they, it was a beginner class, and I had a low center of gravity, and everybody in the class was tall. And so I looked like I was better than everybody else in the, in the, uh, out in the river. So they said, well, Amy will demonstrate for us what it's like to go into the middle of the river, put your oar in, twist around, and come back, because that's the, one of the major things that you have to learn. And you're wearing a spray skirt, so you and the kayak are one. And what happened was that uh, I actually wasn't very good, and I went into the middle of the river, and I was supposed to lean on my kayak and twist around, and I was supposed to come back, but you're always supposed to go in a 45-degree angle, and I went, I went perpendicular. So I fell over and went upside down in the water, and so they tell you you're upside down, or in other words, if anything gets dark, they say just reach around, grab your spray skirt, pull it up, and you'll be free. So I reached around, it was dark, I reached around, I grabbed the spray skirt, and it didn't come off. So I have no instincts at all. You know, everybody else would probably try to do it again, but I was like, oh, that didn't work. So I was running out of air. And so my instinct said, well, you have no air, so breathe. 
So I opened my mouth and went ah, and breathed, and water rushed into my mouth. And it turns out, so I mean, don't, don't ever experiment with this, but it turns out that the first time you take a breath in the water, you have this little flap over your lungs, and it closes. So you can take one breath, you can take one breath underwater and you might be okay. If you do it again, then it's gonna open up and you're probably gonna drown. So I, was, I took that first breath and I had everything that they tell you actually happens, that whole life before your eyes thing happened to me. And I thought about my poor parents and what they sent me on this, they, they gave me this gift of this kayaking trip and I'm from suburbia and I'm in this middle of this river in, in the wilds of Connecticut and I'm dying, and I'm dying, and this is the end. And at the same time that I was thinking that I was dying and I was feeling bad for my family, I was looking up and I could see where the sky was, and I could see all the stuff that I was kicking up, these giant clots of mud and, and uh, plant life, and then also probably the black spots as I was starting to become oxygen deprived. And I was seeing all of this all at once, and then all of a sudden there was this giant pulling, sucking sound, and I was up in the air. And it turned out that even though I was flailing like an idiot, I was flailing so much that instead of flailing into the middle of the river, I was flailing to the side of the river. And so the guys that were uh, the, the instructors actually were able to grab me and pull me before the current got me and I bashed my head on rocks. And so, uh, and before I also took that second breath. And so when I remember this experience, what happens I think is that they, they tell you that you actually take in everything and it seems like it's like you're under there for about 15, 20 minutes because when your mind tries to make sense of an experience like this, it makes it chronological again. So stuff that you were seeing all at once then takes on a narrative. So when I was trying to describe what this felt like, this is what it looked like to me. So I could see the sky and I could see the plants and I could see my oxygen deprivation and my old life and my fears and everything that I was sorry about and so it made a piece like this. And then after that, I said, I'm never going to work this large again. And so I decided after that that I was making too many things about what I feared and making art out of it. This is called, wait, did I, oh, let me go back. Oh, yeah, okay, here we go. So I think that after trying so hard to fix ideas to canvas, it made me a little crazier. And I would say that I probably. I was told it was going to happen. So finally, in a way, I decided I didn't want to work flat anymore. And I went through that sort of blue space and swum out and decided that I didn't want to work with illusion anymore. And I think, uh, I'll probably will go back to it, I think. But I think because I loved low, am I going backwards? No. OK, I'm going backwards, sorry. I think because I love museums and natural history museums so much and the way they show you what things look like in cross sections and side views, uh, I decided I was going to do my own versions. You know, like museums don't tell you how it feels to live in the world, but it organizes and put things into categories because we need to make sense about this great big mess of living. But actual experience, you know, it breaks over us and it's hard to retell. But it's all we have. So I think it's, re and it's reordering your experiences to sort of run the show. So I think to me, I kind of, ben I decided I'm benefiting from science and the way truth and amazing images made by science, but I don't have to mirror the actual truths. I don't have to stick to the facts and I don't have to be rational. Because I'm more interested in what it feels like to be alive than why I am or where I am. So I can make things up. That's the other side of vivarium. So I wanted to see, if you could see the below the surface of something, what would it look like? And this one's called pre-symptomatic, as if you could actually see the causes of something, the causes of symptoms. And that's the other side. And this is called self-absorbed terrarium. Then I came across this wonderful word. It's called uh, biotope, which Lisa mentioned before. 
Um, it sort of sounds like it would describe, it's describes, it's uh, a little area where life literally lives. And it was coined by this extraordinary 19th century zoologist and naturalist and artist Ernst Haeckel. He used it to define a space where the conditions are just right for a specific collection of plants and animals to thrive. Now, Haeckel described the actual, but his descriptions were also formed by his very human imagination. So in a way, he kind of melted his eye and his imagination, what he saw through a microscope, and what he decided he wanted them to look like. So I think that's probably why his engravings are so incredible to look, like, to look at. And also, he made a lot of things up. So he simplified life forms, and he came up with a lot of theories that were discounted later on. But it doesn't matter to me, because his artworks never had to be accepted as a fact. It's just they're just gorgeous. And they're that gorgeous intersection between fact and fiction. So I guess you can say, in a way, it's fake nature. And I also love the work of Leopold and Rudolf Blocksche. And they were a father and a son team of glass artists in the 19th century. Uh, his father was a glass eye maker who started making sculptures of orchids he'd seen in books. And with his son, he was commissioned by museums and universities to make sea creatures and plants in all stages of development. And what was great about it is a lot of it was in decay. So they had no interest in making things look perfect. So I started to make my own biotopes. So I call them their small environments where like, I guess you could say symbiosis is doing its work. You know, since symbiosis is a biological phenomenon and it takes many forms, so some elements work together for mutual benefit or some of the elements coexist, or one destroys the other and thrives, and sometimes they destroy each other. And in a way, that's kind of a really potent metaphor for illness and for fear and for all kinds of human relationships, for our relationship to the environment, and sometimes it works for politics and for love and hate. And so all my biotopes are in stilled phases of growth and decay, where the elements are coexisting and feeding off of each other. And they usually begin based on like, these really specific events and situations. But they grow from this starting point and start to have their own conversations with each other. And this is called Remembering What I Heard and Saw Last Night. This is, it's technically on a uh, flat canvas, but it's a little bit more dimensional than the other ones. This was where I was trying to describe how to translate an experience that I'd had listening to a bird singing at night, and then trying to remember it on the right. Because each time you try to remember something, of course, it changes. And this is called Red Blooming Biotope. Now try not to judge the changes that they're talking about, because you can say that they're blooming, or you can say that they're ripe and about to die. And I think that probably these, my objects are spherical because there's no beginning or end to a sphere. And your thoughts tend to be spherical when you're connecting or concerned with something. Your mind circles around and around. So you could say either that they're growing, or they're rotting, or they're doing it at the same time. This one's called conjoined. I was thinking about how we're connected to people and how we take on the fears and experiences of other people, especially when they're close to them. This one's on the wall, so there's two spheres. It's not a great photograph. I could have had a lot of trouble photographing this one. And that's a detail. There are usually a lot of birds on my pieces, and it depends on the viewer. A lot of people will look at them and see them as living birds, and then a lot of people will see them as dead birds. And I don't tell people whether they're living or dead. You can see underneath, there's a bee's nest. But one thing they always have is there's a sense of passing time. And this is called inconstancy. And this was about someone I loved who was slowly um, changing because of not just age, but uh, because of dementia. And so he was, I'm not saying that he was turning into something that wasn't beautiful. It's, it's up to, you know, it, it was terribly sad and very frustrating and very frightening. But in a way, it was also, the experience itself wasn't beautiful, but 
there's beauty in decay and there's beauty in change and there's beauty in things passing as well. This is contagious. And again, it's the idea of taking on the problems of somebody else and passing your problems and concerns and love and worry onto someone else. It's a detail. And this is called Climb, Cling, and Drift Away. This was in Lisa's show. And this is also on a wall uh, where most of the pieces are attached to the wall, but then the one on the top hangs from the ceiling and it's starting to drift and it's held on. You can see that it's, it's held on by one root. And it's again about when somebody changes and starts to drift away from you. This one is called Tangled Biotope. I love warblers because they're a bird that comes here in the winter, but they're almost impossible to notice until you notice them and then you see them everywhere. And they don't ask for any attention and they don't really want any attention and they just do their thing and then they fly away again in the summer. And this one's blue warbler's biotope. And this one is where you can see the leaves slowly turn into feathers the further away they get from the biotope itself. And that's the bird. And this one actually upsets me so much because the bird uh, doesn't have legs. It's, it's attached. So there's absolutely no escape. This bird cannot leave. But I tried making a piece without the bird. I made a green one because I didn't want to do, um, someone in my gallery asked me to do a green one. I did it without the bird. And then she got, I got it sent back to me because uh, I was told to give it a bird. And it's very, it's very painful because I did not want to make another bird that was literally attached to the sphere, but I did it. Now, this is the first of my collection series. Now, I've always been a collector, and I've never exactly figured out why, because I think that collectors, they find there's things out in the world, and they organize them according to their own rules. And maybe we do it to get close to other people's experiences. Uh, but I make mine not to keep, but to offer them to other people. And most of the time, people buy them individually, so they never get to stay uh, together. So I think what I'm doing is that I'm trying personally to keep track of time and uh, not to souvenir experiences, but sort of to count. And the reason, uh, it's kind of the same reason that you write something down to keep your thoughts from flying away, and it's the reason why you take photographs, uh, to keep things from vanishing. It's a detail. The idea of it is that as one gets sold or goes away or gets sent somewhere else, I make another one. So it's constantly kind of revolving and changing, and, but staying at the same time. This is uh, started being interested in reproducing the way that leaves decay. So I call them the skeleton leaf collection. And this is Red Collection, which uh, has grown from 20 to 40. I'm up to 50. And I wanted to be able to do this my entire life, so eventually I'd love to get up to 200. But I haven't gotten past 50 yet. And red was uh, traditionally the color, uh, I mean, for us, obviously, it's a visceral color. It's a color of passion. It's a color of blood. But it also traditionally has been a color of power and of birth and creation. Can't do wrong with red. And they all hang on the wall. Most of the collection sits on the ground. You can see there, later on there are three examples, but these are meant to be on the wall. Now, these were two of my biotopes that I decided to put out in nature to see 
whether they would look real. And even though, you know, they're fake, of course, and they're meant to be fake nature, but then when you take it out, it sort of looks like some sort of alien spores came down and planted themselves. So what I decided to do was to make stereoscopes out of them. And you can buy stereoscopes on the internet. They're very easy to find. So I would make the object out of stuff that I had found in nature and scanned into the computer and used Photoshop. So they started out like the, a lot of the leaves and the birds started out being real things. And then I turned them into fake things and then tried to make something that looked kind of real. And then brought it out into nature again and photographed it like it was real. And uh, you can make your own stereoscopic photographs just as long as you separate the camera by the distance of your pupils. And it mimics the way your eyes see. So that when you look at it through a stereoscope, it looks three-dimensional through the stereoscope. So you're taking something real, turning it into something fake, taking it out and pretending that it's real, and then looking through at it through a stereoscope, which makes it look like it's real again. But it's not because it's a stereoscope, so it's fake. It's the same technology behind everything you see in 3D in the movie theaters. So then I started to decide I wanted to make more environments under glass, like I used to in the beginning, because most of the things that I would do would wind up framed uh, in shadow boxes under glass. And I used to need the constraints of the glass for my own protection and my own guidance. I was sort of afraid for them to exist out in the world. But now I think I'm more interested in protecting what I'm putting inside. Um, and it's almost an irrational maternal need not to, just to freeze time, but to seal it off. And you can see the Victorians did it too. They, of course, killed countless amount of birds and put them under glass. Uh, the insect vivarium in the middle of the engraving is that they would put live insects inside these little domes and I don't know how long they actually lived in there, but I mean, the idea is really kind of frightening. And then the one on the right is a memoriam to somebody who died made out of their hair. So the bell jar is like the traditional home of Victorian taxidermy of stuffed things and of a, uh, objects of nature removed from their environment and artifacts of mourning. So it's in a way of containing the changed world, remembering things that are gone forever. So I think my stories have become less personal, um, as I simultaneously feel less able to do anything about climate change and animal extinction. I don't feel hopeless, but I'm really increasingly less hopeful. Uh, so I think that maybe my shadow boxes are shadows in a way, like an invented memento mori of an ideal world that never really existed. This is ocular vivarium that's over there. And uh, the berries are made from these photographs that I took of my parents' eyes. I don't know if you can see, but all of those are the irises of my mom's eyes. Uh, some are, there's some of mine, and they're my dad's, uh, which is kind of wonderful now to have his eyes, because in a sense, he's, hey. Okay. Um, in a way, he's still, he's still watching. And uh, I think the last way I ever saw him was his eyes and looking. Um, he was looking at me, and I realized that he was not seeing me for the first time ever. So in a way, he's not seeing and seeing me for as long as I have this piece in my possession. This is called symptomatic vivarium. You can see both sides. And this is uh, where you can see something red underneath sort of veining its way up to the surface. And there's a tiny little red drop coming out of one of the leaves. And the only person who ever noticed that was an eight-year-old kid. And I love that eight-year-old kid for seeing that. Eight-year-olds are great. This is saprotrophic vivarium. Saprotrophic is a fancy word uh, for aging. But a saprotrophic object is something that lives off of decaying material. That's a detail. And of course, these are paper mushrooms. And this is rarefied vivarium. It looks like it's a black and white slide, but it's, uh, it's in color. The only thing that has color are the bees that are underneath the ground. 
And this is the only time I've ever put uh, a representation of a living thing besides the insects under glass. I was absolutely terrified of putting a bird under glass because I thought it's going to suffocate, even though it's, I know it's not real, but they become so real to me that I feel really, really guilty for trapping them. But at the same time, I want them trapped. And these are the shadow boxes I've been working on. This one is called cross pollinators. This is larger. This is about 20 by 20. So I think the shadow boxes are sort of like things frozen in this cycle of symbiosis, where things that are happening are barely visible to us in our everyday lives. But if these things, these elements, these insects and creatures, honeybees are diminished or destroyed, they will, it will change our world, our lives, the world as we know it. So I want to stop time, but I know that's ridiculous because you can't. And I know that artwork isn't going to do anything. It's a very minor player in the attempt to change things. But I think I'm making them anyway, sort of making the natural world over uh, the way I would like them to be, the way I would like them to stay. So my paper bees sort of have a free reign. And I, got, I give them their own biotopes, their own little worlds. And you can see here, I give them their own biotopes so they can be sort of set free into space, maybe get away from all of us and our complexities and all our issues and our politics. These are the last biotopes. I've been doing these for a bee show um, in North Carolina, where the whole theme of the show is about pollinators and the collapse of the European honeybee. And I so want to give them their own space and their own world where they can thrive. So ultimately, I think that no matter what your work is about, that the pain and pleasure of it comes from doing it. So if that's not the affirmation of being here, I don't know what is. Um, I think I was going back to working with my hands after years of avoiding it, of using the tools that people who used to obsess over the needle and thread in the past and never had, like digital cameras and scanners and computers and the avalanche of images that's the internet and the world that's both visible and invisible. Because they're presented to us like slices of cake and in a time where speed and convenience and slipping time, I mean, working like this, bead by bead, stitch by stitch, you know, slice by slice is like keeping time with the most elemental parts of your life, like the click of your thoughts and the beat of your pulse and the rhythm of your breathing. I mean, it's ridiculous because it's so laborious and it's wonderful, I think, because it is because everything is put there because you put it there. And at the same time, it winds up there through these mysteries that you can just barely understand. And I think it links, it links you back to childhood when you really felt so part of the world and you could stare at ants and potato bugs for hours and you felt like it really mattered. So I think that you know, when I do see an adult, when I see a grown person and they're staring at one of my pieces, and I see them and they're bent over just a little bit. You know, even if they see things that I don't intend and, or they don't think much of it or they don't understand it, I feel like I've still done something. Because looking through a microscope or a telescope, I, I find it requires like the same eye squint. And I love the eye squint and the centering and the looking in. So uh, during an opening of an exhibit, someone told me that they overheard one of the people uh, who was setting up my piece say that if he stood there long enough, he thought, that something would crawl out of it. And to me, that was the best, best compliment he could have paid me. So thank you very much for listening.